and do use the chat function at the bottom of the screen to let us know where you're viewing us from. Canada, wow, the stakes are already high. Nova Scotia in Canada, you have York, Brighton, do let us know. Just give it uh, 30 seconds more as people continue to come in and then we'll get going. Great. Well, good to welcome you all again to the first of our lunchtime seminars on mixing religion and politics. My name is Nick Spencer and I'm Senior Fellow at Theos. It's great to have you here. Theos, many of you will know, is a Christian think tank and we exist to tell a better story a better story about faith in general and Christianity specifically in contemporary public life. One of the reasons, perhaps the main reason, why people are antipathetic to religion in general and religion in public life in particular, is that they fear what happens when religion and politics meet. And let's be honest, there are more than one or two historical examples to justify that fear. In all fairness, the 20th century has shown that atheism has not got much of a better record in this department, but it is nonetheless religion that seems to need to justify itself here. And so it's important not only to talk about this subject, but to show how the mixing of religion and politics has been and can be intelligent, thoughtful, constructive, and above all, humanistic, in the truest sense of that word. Over the next three weeks, we'll be exploring this mixture of religion and politics, looking at democratic pluralism, the idea of justice, and starting this week with the common good with Professor Anna Rowlands. Before I introduce Anna and the topic more fully, a little bit of housekeeping. The seminar, as you know, will last for an hour and we promise to stop hard at 1.30. After I've introduced Anna, she'll talk for 15 minutes or so, after which she and I will have a short conversation before taking questions and comments from our virtual floor. The chat box will be turned off shortly but, um, and be reopened uh, as we close. But if you do want to ask a question, could I ask you to put it in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen? And then Anna and I will be able to see it. And if we get a lot, as I suspect we will, we'll try and, or I will try and collate them, draw them together and ask kind of groups of questions or groups of similar questions all at the same time. So we get as many different questions and comments as possible. Just a little tip. For any of you who do want to ask a question, if possible, please keep it short. Um, it's just so much easier as a chair to read and digest shorter questions when you're getting a lot coming in. And basically, you're much more likely to have a question asked if it is short and pithy. Um, we are um, live streaming on YouTube as well as Zoom, but we're only taking questions from people who are on Zoom. Um, but um, although the seminar is not being recorded on Zoom, you will be able to watch it again on YouTube. And so to our speaker, Dr. Anna Rowlands is the St. Hilda Professor of Catholic Social Thought and Practice in the Department of Theology and Religion at Durham University and a member of the Centre for Catholic Studies. She is a political theologian and works on Catholic social teaching, Anglican social theology, religion and forced migration and the politics of the common good and the social philosophies of Hannah Arendt, Simone Weil and Gillian Rose. She's most recently the author of The Politics of Communion, Catholic Social Teaching in Dark Times, 
which I would strongly encourage you to read and will be advertised again at the end of our session with a promotion code. Um, perhaps most importantly in all this, um, Anna happened to be one of my examiners during my Viva. So in many ways, this is an opportunity for payback as well as for education. Anna, it's great to have you with us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Nick, and thank you um, for the, to the team at Theos for organising this. And most importantly, it's great to see a range of people in the comment uh, chat box that I already uh, know. So hi to those people and great to see lots of people who I haven't had contact with before as well. Um, so thank you for giving up your lunchtime to think about the common good together. And that's the idea. So I am going to talk for sort of 10, 15 minutes and I'm going to offer a kind of position statement. Um, which is to be responded to and the whole point is to have together a common good conversation about the topic of the common good. So here goes my um, kind of input that's meant to stimulate thought, critique, comment and conversation between us in a shared task. In his 2009 Wreath Lectures, the public philosopher Michael Sandel offered a compelling defence of the idea of the common good. Sandel is one of a number of thinkers and political actors who've appealed for the return of the common good to our public life. From East, sorry, from European left-wing populism to the UK Green Party to conservative populism in Hungary and Poland, a putative buried idea has risen, but interestingly without much agreement on what it might actually mean. In fact, quite often with quite opposing meanings attached. In his final wreath lecture, Sandel painted a vivid picture. Over half a century, he says, we've drifted in our public life from civic virtue and solidarity traditions of citizenship towards the idea that you and I are basically consumer citizens. Sandel thinks we've refashioned education, health, governance, and indeed democracy itself in this way. We haven't done this just because the market came to dominate everything and we had no choice. He thinks that's too lazy an answer. It's just as much about the fact that somehow collectively we've lost confidence in how to handle ideas of moral value in public life. It was a relief to us to think that maybe non-judgmental processes of individual choice, technocratic process and gentle nudging behaviorism could steer us a course. Sandel applies this critique equally to both mainstream political left and right. In 2009, Sandel's view was that the consumer citizen, this is his phrase, could not be the basic of civic virtue or of a rich common good. And our attempt to suppress questions of moral value in our public lives, he thought, simply wasn't working. Moral disagreements were springing back at us vital, we might say, from the shallow grave that we tried to bury them in. Sandel's reply was this, we need to return and pay proper attention to the idea of the common good as a language of moral value, of moral dispute, and that's key, not just moral agreement, but moral dispute and of common striving. We must resurrect ourselves as citizens and once again recognize that questions of ecology, of inequality, are moral and spiritual questions. And I think it's really interesting that Sandel insists they're moral and spiritual questions. That in turn, inequality makes harder the existence of credible intermediary spaces of social encounter. As my former PhD student, Andrew Grinnell, who I spotted online earlier says, we need places where we can show up. As Hannah Arendt would say, Places where we can learn to appear to each other, where I hear what you hear, see what you see, and vice versa. Without these spaces of face-to-face -face encounter, embodied listening and response, we can't build the basic things that nurture public life. Trust, altruism, solidarity. The absence of these things, trust, altruism, and solidarity, isolates us and destroys a sense of a common life. In the next few minutes, I want to agree with everything Sandel says, apart from the fact that Christians do not begin their thinking about the common good from an identity as state citizens alone, but I would say from a dual citizenship, an account which stretches the meaning of the common good 
in what I think are helpful and fairly demanding ways. So this isn't about demanding everybody's a Christian in public life or it's the only narrative, but it's saying that there is a wider, deeper and even more demanding narrative available in the Christian tradition and that actually it leads to a richer account as our contribution to public life in a pluralist way. So Christians have common cause with Sandel, but a different story to tell and a wider and more demanding conception of where that might lead. Christians cannot simply swap faith in the market for faith in state citizenship, period. It's more complicated and I think more hopeful than that. And I'll make that case briefly by suggesting what I think is distinctive, not necessarily unique, but distinctive about a Christian common good approach. The first distinctive hallmark of a Christian conception of the common good it is that it's what I would call a realist one. Now, by that, I don't mean being realistic. OK, so what I mean by a realist conception is that the common good is for a Christian quite simply, first and foremost, God. God is our first and ultimate common good. And the goodness of God is a present reality sustaining every moment of our lives. The good is therefore a historical force, the very possibility of history itself. It's not just a concept or a future horizon. It's a life we are created to be drawn into, an existing good common to us all and with a shared responsibility to struggle in history against everything that frustrates that good being a felt reality for all. Now, this has the advantage of meaning that the common good isn't grounded in our actions alone, nor is it lost entirely when we fail, even if we fail for a whole generation. This realist foundation is what holds open the future in the grimmest of the present and means that we can face it with some real, not some false or cheap hope. So in the first instance, it means that we're called to recognize ourselves as already placed and graced within a dynamic reality of a pre-existing and future-based good. As such, human beings are then co-creators, participants within an active process of the good in history, called to respond to and witness to all that is good and to lament, to rage and to struggle for that life. That's the meta story. And citizenship is one part of that life of participation, co-creation and struggle. Now, beginning here matters for many reasons, one of which is that it allows us to fail, to repent, to forgive and to start again. The other is that it allows for a vastly plural range of social practices that uphold the common good. There's not just one route towards that. It's not just a statist task, for example. So not just active state citizenship and not just things that are dependent on you and I being recognised as state citizens. It's perhaps obvious to state that in a UK and global context, it's worth remembering that many do not have the luxury of state citizenship. And Christian common good thinking has something to say to the lives of those in a territory who are, who are not considered to be citizen members. So what are some of these wider practices that I might be referring to? Well, that takes us into a second dimension of a Christian scriptural account of the common good. In the early church, there was a strong tradition of appealing to Matthew 25 as the common good text. If you want to know what the common good looks like for a Christian, then start here. It means contingent bodily practices of care for those who you share a space with, those who you encounter in your lives. It means quite literally feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the prisoner, comforting the sufferer and the mourner, hosting the stranger and so forth. There's no confusion about what Christian common good practices are. The best citizens are those who know how to mourn, how to weep, how to rejoice and to do so for themselves and in accompaniment of others. These are unashamedly civic practices for the early church. Equally emphasised is a duty to ensure, as Psalm 24 has it, that the goods of the earth are distributed to all justly. So this isn't charity versus justice, a lazy dismissal that's often made um, of the public usefulness of Christian ethics. It's both and and more. The scriptural and early church vision of the common of common good practices includes these practices of care, of service, of public debate, of education, of formation of character, 
of contemplation and prayer, and it's worth saying that contemplation and prayer are seen by the early church as common good practices and care for the wider creation and so forth. Prayer as a common good practice is part of our training in how to pay attention to the world, not a distraction from it. Prayer is part of how we learn how to place ourselves and see ourselves placed, how to learn what deserves our attention and what does not. In practice, living out a Matthew 25 set of common good practices can and does bring many into a degree of conflict with state authorities. Prisons, refugee care, care of the aging and hunger are exactly on our public policy front lines right now. And Christian common good thinking spotlights these. A third emphasis is found in the writings of St. Paul. For Paul, the common good is the body of Christ, made up of the diverse skills, gifts, talents, and fleshment callings of each of us, participation, uh, participating uh, in a life of loving God and loving neighbor. This Pauline imagery of the body is important because it stresses that the common good is not for the Christian, like a seminar room discussion, where the core task of the common good is to reach intellectual agreement and then cascade that agreement downwards. It's not unity by agreement. Nor is the common good like a manifesto. Disappointingly, it's not a list of fixed commitments that I can rattle off for you. It is something that comes about within a social body that can find some real unity within its plurality. Striving for the life of the common good requires a participating community that values difference, difference of gift, of calling, of culture, and crucially, creates spaces and initiates processes in time where these can speak to each other and become something greater than the sum of their parts. This is not a crude multiculturalism or relativism, but something much richer, more joyful and more demanding. A Matthew 25 and Pauline shaped common good is discerned, known, loved within communities of diverse people who have access to the means of survival and flourishing and equal chances to participate. It implies historical communities capable of repenting their past in the hope of a better future. In the present moment, it is as good as the good experienced by those struggling most, the most excluded, the most vulnerable, and the most without hope. And it begins with a preference for their flourishing, for in theirs lies ours too. So this implies that we should be asking the following kinds of questions, I think. What forms of community life do we think can give expression to such co-creative processes? How do we name the various structural and mindset challenges that block or frustrate or limit such visions of the good? What do we believe are the enduring forms of power, of violence, of force, of dispossession, of need, of manufactured vulnerability and hopelessness that are expressions of the lack, suppression and refusal of the common good in our midst? What practical processes in public policy and at grassroots levels can open a space for institutional renewal beyond the consumer citizen logic, but also beyond the state citizen logic too? A final footnote. Pope Francis, operating from that realist mindset, reminds us that we should assume that the common good is already alive and probably in places we might not expect but that it needs networks of connection, as Sister Margaret Atkins puts it, a trellis structure to grow and connect from healthy roots outwards and upwards. Pope Francis has also talked about being brave enough to name the fact that striving for the common good means a willingness to face suffering and walk the costly path of accompaniment. There is no renewal of solidarity and trust without that. Only then do we really get to a place beyond the consumer citizen model, beyond relationships of mere supply and demand into the deepest places of human freedom. Michael Sandel does glimpse this too, I think, when he says towards the end of his read lectures that the basic things that build the common good and strengthen the common good are not finite resources that can be used up but things that multiply with nurture and with practice. The conditions for the nurture of these is where the moral conversations 
across and between traditions, I think needs to lie. Thank you. Anna, thank you ever so much indeed. Uh, as I knew there would be an awful lot there, um, very rich, quite demanding. Um, we've got a few questions in already, so this is an opportunity for you yeah, to um, pop your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, whilst Anna and I are having a conversation here, we'll try and collate um, and I'll put them to Anna in our last half hour. But I want to take the chair's prerogative, as it were, and just um, fire a few questions um, of my own. Before we get on to the kind of the substance of the common good, I want to pick up on one of the lines you mentioned early on about how we have lost confidence in how to handle ideas of moral value in public. I think that was one of Sandel's lines. I suspect, what's his question, you would agree with it. Why? Where has it gone? Why are we so anxious about moral conversations in politics today? Um, so I think that part of the big answer to that goes all the way back to the roots of um, liberal modernity. Um, and if you think about a great text of the philosophical tradition like Thomas Hobbes's Leviathan, right back in the context of the English Civil War and the kind of politics that flow out of that, um, you have this sense that if you bring big questions of moral disagreement, the big value questions of the good life into public debate and into politics, it results in a kind of violence. So what happens is you get, the more that you bring the big questions into a political frame and into a public frame of reference, the more you end up potentially with a very, very frayed and frazzled social contract. You end up with a massive problem um, of simply competing visions of the good life and that drives a kind of violence. And what we all deeply long for deep down is peace. We just want a peaceful life. And peaceful life means that you privatize those big questions. And what you do in the public space is you aggregate forms of self-interest and you work out, you bottom out to the most basic forms of self-interest that we can negotiate together. And for Hobbes, obviously, this is the fear of death. Um, he doesn't think we're inherently violent. And I think this is often a, a misportrayal of his work. He thinks that we're basically diffident as human beings. So I'm a bit scared that you might not have my interests at heart. You might attack me. And so out of diffident fear, I get in there first. Um, so actually it's diffidence rather than just inherent violence that drives us as human beings. And I think his vision of public life flows out from that belief in our ultimate diffidence as human beings um, that drives forms of social conflict. So I think that's part of the meta story that we told ourselves that if we do this, it leads to violence and that we cannot base a social contract on that. And the best thing to do is privatise those questions um, and instead have a public space built on forms of negotiated self-interest. Now, interestingly, Hobbes's answer was also... Um, to have a very authoritarian figure who resolved the big questions and disputes, hence the Leviathan of the title. So in a sense, he pushes into a private space, those moral questions, and creates an ultimate decider, an ultimate arbiter, who gets to decide over matters of belief, um, as well as matters of, of just kind of uh, general public life. Now, obviously, that model, as liberalism went on, uh, fragmented, and there were many different versions of how we might do that. But I think Hobbes is a key moment, precisely because he expresses that dilemma. And, and there flows from that, I think, an assumption that we don't easily do this in public life, and that we need to find ways to contain that process, ideally to limit it, and the space of politics becomes one of transaction and negotiated self-interest. So, so that makes a, a, a lot of sense to me. And actually, it picks up on one of the questions that's already been asked about the link between the common good and states somehow pushing out individual rights. I'm, I'm going to park that, though, because I want to put one other question or more of an observation to you, really, just to get to reflect on. I, you know, I have a, you know, I think that's by and large correct analysis. And there's a slight allergy or a significant allergy about you know, politicians about imposing, I put that word in scare quotes, the, the common good, and therefore, as you say, a move towards um, value neutrality and transactional and consumer citizenship. At the same time, yesterday in Parliament, about 300, year, 300 yards from where I'm sitting at the moment, there was an awful lot of moral language. I mean, yes, laws were being broken, but goodness me, the most powerful speeches were those couched in explicitly moral terms. So do we overplay the death of morality in political life a bit? Is it, is it actually just quite healthy, just not, not as well observed? 
So my argument would be that on the one hand, we've told ourselves that meta story I was talking about a minute ago, that we can't do this well and we should try not to do it. But it's impossible not to do it because it's so hardwired into our nature to do this that it bursts out from the straight jackets that we try to set ourselves. So what happens is we always moralize in public life. We constantly appeal to moral language because in the end we have to. So the question is how to do this well how not to suppress it, but how to create the right conditions, the right institutions, the right processes that allow this part of our nature that's so important to be expressed and to be expressed for the good. Now, you know, there are many, you and I both know, there are many, many versions of answers to how you begin to do that. Um, and that immediately brings a whole other series of contested questions into play, but nonetheless, the example of Parliament yesterday is exactly right. We do this anyway. It leaks out from around the sides and it's hardwired in our nature to do it. So yes, we overplay the idea of the death of morality. The problem is that it often happens in fractured and fragmented forms, escaping from the sides of processes rather than being actually part of the mainstream process itself. It reminds me of something John Gray once said in a uh, column about how the Victorians tried to preempt pretend that sex didn't exist and ended up yeah. doing absurd things like covering covering the legs of tables yeah. of course it emerges that's um, right and his argument was that faith emerges even in quote unquote yeah, faithless yeah, yeah. eras and morality is basically a similar point you're making isn't it yeah absolutely right yeah yeah let me pick up on one of the questions that's been asked then about the link between um historically between a conception of the common good and um, collectivism, the, the person asking the question uh, phrased it, and the way in which sometimes in the 20th century, states used moral arguments, collective arguments, common good arguments to override the uh, rights of citizens and how you know, there's quite a substantial body of um, social scientific research and the questioner mentions one example of this, how, for example, societies are secured and and their, their wealth and their well-being is enabled by, for example, the securing of property rights and individual liberties. We're talking about the common good. It's got a bit of a halo here. Has it sometimes, are we, are, are we being a bit naive, a bit innocent about what the common good is capable of doing? So one of the things that I try and do in the book is I try and make a distinction between the sort of historical moral performance of the idea of the common good, which is exactly as your questioner and, and, and you're indicating, that's something that we can trace historically. And the 20th century is a brilliant case study for the fairly poor moral performance in politics of the idea of the common good. And that um, refers to everything from... Um, uh, common good language used by forms of collectivist um, politics. It also is used by various forms of fascist and totalitarian regimes of the right um, as well. So there's kind of right and left collectivism, if you can think about it in those terms. And it's also there in a resurgent fashion um, in forms of um, conservative populism right now as well. And it emerges, one of the things that I think is in common um, with those approaches and, and is therefore a warning sign of the common good used, I think, in an unhelpful way, is that they tend to be theory, strongly focused on theories of natural order, that there is a natural order, there is a discernible common good that we can simply lock down and foreclose, and that, that can be imposed um, as a kind of agreed manifesto on people. And I think those kind of um, theories of natural order and um, political invocations of the common good um, are often deep dangerous and damaging. But the common good itself is, is language that has been invoked by every different political persuasion um, across the board, uh, both historically through the 20th century and right now in its resurgent forms. And it really does mean vastly different things in different contexts. So um, some of the kind of left-leaning populist movements in Spain and France and elsewhere um, use it as a way of thinking about politics as a form of collective struggle towards a future horizon. So they use it as an idea where it's a kind of heuristic use of it. There's a, there's a future horizon. And in order to keep open that horizon, we name that the common good. And the point of politics is to identify the struggle to form collective identities and movements in history, which is a very particular definition of what politics is. But they're using the common good 
uh, in that way. Somebody like Victor Orban in Hungary is using it more in that natural order tradition where it is a set of fixed ideas that we can discern and we can know and we can list them and it looks like this and there needs to be agreement on those and then we simply codify them into policy. That's very different from that kind of left-wing um, uh, use of it in, in left-wing populism. So we, we see exactly those dilemmas played out right now. Yes, the moral performance of the idea is really, really uh, complicated and requires really careful attention. That's the reason why I think we need to think more about it, not less about it, because thinking about its use historically, but actually not letting go of it in those terms, for example, an idea like human dignity is invoked in the 20th century in very similar ways. So you get fascist regimes that invoke the idea of human dignity and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights invoking it and so forth. We don't abandon the idea of human dignity on that basis, but it means we must be very sharply attentive to its co-option um, and I would say to its misuse. Um, in terms of things like private property rights and individual rights, again, this depends on which common good tradition you belong to. Um, most of the mainstream Christian traditions of, the, of thinking about the common good acknowledge some relative right to private property and individual liberties, um, but they don't see that as absolute. So that's an interesting ground for kind of teasing out further discussion in itself. And there's a move in contemporary political theology now to re-emphasizing what belongs to the commons as part of the common good and a whole tradition of the necessity of rethinking the commons. Um, so all those big questions about uh, what, what kind of collective uh, reality we uh, wish to inhabit, how property and ownership relates to that, the distribution of goods, those are thrown wide open right now in the social space that we inhabit. Personally, I think that's a good thing that these are now massively contended ideas because I think they absolutely need to be contended again. Mm. You're highlighting then about the um, distinction, as it were, between um, the conception of the common good as fixed, um, as part of the natural order, uh, versus a common good which um, is focused on processes or, or, or certainly integrates processes. Um, reminds me of, I think it's a bit in your book, certainly in an earlier conversation we've had about your own particular common good experience in a pub in, was it Newcastle or Sunderland? No, it was in Sunderland. Sunderland, yeah. beg your pardon. Yeah. Just briefly tell us what happened there, because I think that was a, a lovely and quite kind of uh, humane example of what a, a common good practice can look like in reality. Yeah. Yeah, well, but, I mean, it has to be said this this was not intentionally designed as a common good yes. process. It's like the accidents of history. Um, I was invited by a local um, Catholic church in Sunderland to give a talk in a pub on a Sunday evening. And they very impressively have a series of um, sort of theology talks in, in a pub in the centre of Newcastle, uh, sorry, in the centre of Sunderland on a Sunday evening. Now, when I was invited to do this, I assumed they'd booked an upstairs room quietly in the pub. Um, and I arrived on the evening to discover that, in fact, there was just a microphone at the end of the bar with a huge screen above the microphone blaring out Britain's Got Talent. This was about two weeks before the Brexit referendum and just an ordinary crowd of Sunday evening drinkers in the centre of Sunderland. Anyway, in flowed the parishioners from the local parish, in flowed um, a group from a local Iranian church um, that had been meeting and various others who'd heard that there was a talk that was going to touch on Pope Francis and migration. So anyway, I hastily, oh, and I had a busker as my warm-up act. So that was the other <laughs> kind of, I've never had a busker as a, he was absolutely brilliant. He was raising money to go off and live in Australia. Anyway, um, so I had a busker as my warm-up act. I quickly realised that I needed to tear up the piece of paper I had my written talk on and find a way to catch people's attention. So I uh, talked for about 20 minutes and then I said to people, but question and answer is not going to work. So I said, look, what I hear constantly is that there is a kind of deafness in politics where Westminster politicians, et cetera, refuse to talk about the issues that really matter. And we're incapable of having conversations at a level that touches on the things that really matter to people. So my suggestion is that instead of question and answer, we have a common good conversation. And the rules for the common good conversation are you can talk about the things in your life, in your community, in your neighborhood that you aspire to as gen genuine goods. What are the things you want in your life and why are they good for you? Everybody else is required to listen and everybody has a chance to speak. You may not criticize or blame anybody else, but you can express anger, loss, um, frustration, um, but you just can't blame that this is not a context for blame and we'll listen politely to each other. 
And um, although this was never set up as a kind of designed process, as it were, what flowed was a brilliant conversation in which people talked about the absolutely basic things that they thought made a decent, dignified life. Neighbourhoods in which people know each other, decent and meaningful work, an ability to not have to be socially mobile, um, to stay where you have networks and families and landscape that you feel you belong in, or to travel the world and experience different cultures and meet other people and learn from them. And people exchanged their experiences of those different visions of the good, and they listened and they responded. Um, and actually, um, people disagreed wildly, but actually um, there was an experience of people in the room listening. So I don't want to over sort of turn it into yeah. some perfect experience because it wasn't and it was certainly totally unplanned. But actually that capacity to talk about basic moral things that matter to people in the fibre of their lives um, and not to do that in, in such a kind of policy one way that we yeah. miss the basic orientations of those goods. Thank you. Um, let me ask a completely different question. Actually, a few questions that have come in. I'm going to group, group a couple of them together. Um, one question from David. How do you respond to Miroslav Volf's idea that work in the spirit is cooperation with God in the renewal of creation? And another question from um, Date, 1945. You have used the term co-create a couple of times. Could you elaborate? So I think there are questions about what you mean by co-creation and what that might look like theologically. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm I mean, I'm happy with um, Wolf's um, uh, description of, of, of that process. And I think that the idea that the spirit is at work in history and what we do is we cooperate with that. Um, reality through a radical openness and receptiveness in our own spirit. If I'd had longer, and I do talk about this in the book, um, one of the things that I argue is a really distinctive hallmark of a Christian approach to the common good for a Christian, it's not to impose it um, on anybody else, is the sense that the first um, thing that happens in a common good process is one of reception rather than action. And Rome Williams talks powerfully about this. So the first thing we do as Christians is we receive. It's a receptive movement rather than a kind of um, imposing one. And, and what we are receiving is the life of the spirit and an openness um, to um, a Trinitarian God. So in receiving, then there is an exchange of gift. Um, Joseph Pieper, um, he's a 20th century German speaking um, Catholic philosopher, um, talks beautifully about distinguishing between the world. And by the way, I do have some problems with this, but um, I'll just set it out for a moment. Um, distinguishing between the world of common need, where we meet basic needs for food and shelter and survival, and we all have those basic common needs and they all absolutely should be met. And then what he sees is the world of the common good, which he wants to distinguish from common need. And he says, the world of the common good is that space of call and response. It's that space beyond mere need, beyond mere transaction, beyond supply and demand. And when we turn everything just into a logic of supply and demand or common need, we forget about this life that exceeds that, the life that actually brings us joy, where we most express and encounter our freedom. And that is this co-creative space, because there's something, he talks about this is the space in which we pierce the dome. This is the space where there's something of transcendence that we touch. Um, and, and that's the space of the common good that we need to be able to think about. That's the co-creative space where something is happening in human freedom in response to the call of a divine creator. And something happens in history um, in that moment. And, and that, I think, is powerful and beautiful, um, richly theological. And we need to be able to talk about that. Thank you. I have a question from Sharon Prayer as a common good practice. Do you think that religious ritual can be an activist tool in the public or political sphere? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, if you think about, um, I mean, I do quite a lot of work on migration and one of the most striking images of recent years um, is um, the Eucharist being celebrated across the US-Mexico border. Um, with um, a communion table, an altar on either side of the division wall um, and uh, communion being shared through uh, the, the, the gaps in the fences. Um, religious ritual um, has a way of expressing our fundamental unity, our co-belonging and demanding a world um, that is revolutionized towards the practices of the kingdom. 
Um, so not only do I think that prayer is how we develop attention, which I really do think, and I believe that quite strongly, um, but I also think that religious ritual absolutely can literally play out a different story. And in doing so, it invokes a social imagination um, that the state and the market sometimes want to squeeze out. And that's not to pathologize either the state or the market. Um, I believe we need systems of exchange. And I also believe we need systems of governance. Um, but both of them have tendencies that, that will uh, break down much of that richer um, world that a Christian narrative is opening to us. Thank you. A uh, question from Cathy. Will you say more on the connection between reconciliation, the common good, and totality of relationships. And I guess reconciliation, at least my, my reading of it, is kind of the, the, the key word in that question, the connection between reconciliation, common good, and relationships. Um, is there a specific... I'm well, I'll tell you what, I'll, that and I'll, let, I'll, let Kathy, that. I'll let Kathy to jump in on the chat to maybe to clarify that question. Or or, yeah, 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 because I'm... We'll, I mean, we'll come back to what Kathy, if you're, if you're sure there, give us just a tiny bit more detail. I want to ask yeah. a question. Well, um, I was going to ask a question, actually, in our initial conversation about the almost, well, I'll put this slightly tongue-in-cheek, inverse correlation between the popularity of the common good and its precision. Um, and the way that it is so wonderfully kind of uh, celebrated precisely because we can't we can't pin it down. Um, and that kind of is in the same vein as a, a question here from my former colleague Ben Ryan he said as a quick look at Hansard shows common good has been used 4,427 times in just the last five years. I can testify to that. I once had a Hansard alert set up for common good and I had to turn it off because it was just turned out all the time all the time but he goes on to say only a handful use it in the way that catholic social teaching does is the term just too buried in other particularly utilitarian conceptions to be helpful in some conversations so this is back to this presenting question is we're all talking about the common good um but we're not all necessarily talking about the same idea of the common good yeah, um, I'll make an unlikely response first, which is I do think that Christians can't claim to own the language of the common good. Um, we use it, but we did not use it first, and it exists already within a plural and contested register before Christians ever came on the scene to use the idea. Um, and we adopt it um, and we Christianize it in the ways that I've described. And I think that Christianization process is interesting because it is, it is changed in the light of the event of Jesus Christ and its meaning changes in that light, hence the Matthew 25 text, et cetera. So I don't think we can expect that only a Christian or a Catholic social teaching uses or whatever would occur in our public life. That's just the first thing. However, I absolutely agree that of course it's used to mean an endless variety of things, but I want to say two things about that. One is that makes Sandel's point really clearly. It, it is still used and invoked, even if in infuriatingly vague ways, because the language is powerful. There's power in the phrase. And so that, that actually gives me some hope, the fact that it would continue to be used even when some of the associations are fragmented or broken down. Um, so, so I think that's important. The second thing to say is though, I agree with Ben that often the usages of it are primarily utilitarian or they simply really stand for something like the national economic interest. And I did a lot of work tracing through common good in, spe in political speeches. Um, in the UK and the US, um, so in the kind of Anglosphere, and most often the common good simply meant something along the lines of um, um, uh, the national economic interest. That is not what a broader understanding of the common good, and most definitely not what a Christian understanding of the common good could boil down to. So there is a process of needing to thicken our own understanding of it, and to enter that plural space, and to contest it on our own grounds. But I don't think everybody should necessarily be expected to speak as we do, and I have no problem with the plurality of meanings. Um, I think Christians need to learn how to hold their own in that space, and that requires a literacy in our own traditions. That Interesting, that answer reminds me a little of a question I was asked a few years ago when I wrote a book on how the parable of the Good Samaritan has been used in mm, British and yeah, American yeah. public discourse for, for many, many years and used by everyone from Jeremy Corbyn's Margaret Thatcher and used in some radically different ways. And people yeah. pointed out in a similar way, well, what content does it have if it's used so broadly? And in many sense, you know, the content is very elastic. But my answer, which was similar to yours there, is that at least it's there and it keeps the space <laughs> open. It keeps the space open whereby... You know, we can continue to have these 
very important ethical conversations without pretending that you know, the market in a state is sufficient. Uh, let me ask a question from Ruth. How can people who are invisible shut away in homes, residential homes, care homes, prisons and other public spaces, thinking especially of disabled people, including children and young adults, contribute to the common good? Um, well, uh, one of the first things I would say is, and this is why I used the Pope Francis material at the end, um, there isn't simply a common good out there um, that they have to contribute to, as it were. Um, I think that very often people in those situations are precisely already um, enacting a logic of the common good, invisible to us, but visible in their own context. And I'll give just a very kind of practical example of what I mean by that. Um, I did some work with the Jesuit Refugee Service a couple of years ago, interviewing people who had been um, uh, asylum seekers in the system, so seeking asylum, um, and who had been in immigration detention facilities. And people would were, were describing to me the absolute damage and trauma of being in immigration detention facilities. What they also were telling me were stories of how they had acted for the care of other de detainees and how other detainees had acted for their care how they had saved the lives of other detainees, how extraordinary community had been formed around chapels inside immigration detention facilities and so forth. There was an enacting on a micro scale in the most limited and traumatic of circumstances of an ethic of the common good that frankly would challenge me in terms of my own um, experience of that in an everyday sense. So I think this is precisely what Pope Francis means when he says, look for the common good already present in those contexts and the way in which people, particularly in the most liminal and sometimes the most impoverished situations are already creating that life because they know best often how to. They are most expert in the conditions of solidarity and mutual support. And again, in my wider refugee work, refugees support other refugees. The networks of survival are about the social capital that refugees build amongst themselves. So I think very often the common good is already in those contexts. Where there is a gap is between centers of power and those peripheries. And the question is how, and this is why I was using the trellis analogy that Margaret Atkins uses, how do you connect those green shoots of true common good practices to the central sources that are so powerful in determining our everyday existences? How, how do you renew those structures and how are those voices, which I think is exactly where I would agree with the logic of the questioner of Reef, how do those um, people inform and have their voices heard as experts by experience, um, often both in the lack of the common good in a structured and systematic way, but also the presence of solidarity and meaning making and what's most necessary. How do those voices connect? And we don't, we lack, and Rowan Williams talks about this profoundly, we lack the intermediate spaces necessary for the connecting of those voices and processes. So it's not just about the absence of an idea or getting the idea right in some ideal construction, this is about practical processes um, and what we lack are the context, the spaces, um, the processes in time that allow us to make those connections and for renewal to really flow from the grassroots. I mean, just building on that, there is an enormous emphasis in political rhetoric around listening and no politician worth his or her salt will ever, you know, send anything other than they are listening. I mean, we, we heard that yesterday and we, we've heard that in many other conditions as well. I'm not going back to the Sea Grey report, I'm going to leave that alone. But listening is very important. You, and you've talked about listening. But what you seem to be saying is that that isn't enough. That That's a kind of, I don't want to put words into your mouth, so correct me. That's more of a kind of an ad hoc stance, whereas we need more rigorous processes and reliable independent structures whereby that listening can be dug deep into the channels of power. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. I think that we need ways to hardwire the experiences of people who are most dependent on those state structures and processes, for example, to hardwire their experiences into the very way that those systems are designed and executed. And when that doesn't happen, you end up with perverse systems that serve nobody. Um, the current immigration system is a good example of that. The current welfare system is a good example of that. Um, current practices around care for the elderly. I mean, there's, there are so many examples of the perversity of public policy um, around areas where the most, var most marginal and most vulnerable are placed. And very often, and this is why I was quite careful with my language and what I said, vulnerability is not an inherent social condition for many of those groups. Vulnerability is manufactured by the system. Yes, I noticed that phrase. It's a very telling phrase. 
Um, we've had a few questions in about nationhood and nations. I'm going to pick one of them um, from Colin. What place do the nation or the ethnos have in a common good? What or who is common? And I guess kind of my, my PS to that is that, you know, it, I, I've heard nation spoke of in both registers when it comes to the common good. At least the nation is a cohesive unit. There is a we-ness to it. It can be something that can therefore help construct the common good. At the same time, it is by definition an exclusive entity which holds the good of others at less significant as its own. So how does the nation state or the nation fit into your thinking here? Um, so, well, the first thing I should say is that this is a massive area of contestation and dispute amongst common good thinkers, amongst advocates of Christian social ethics and political theology more generally. So there are those who would advocate absolutely a very strong theological focus on ethnos and nation and those who think absolutely you cannot theologize ethnos and nation. And the minute you start doing that, you're to hell in a handcart. So, um, so just to say that this is massively contested, I suppose the questions I would ask personally uh, run something along these lines. Are we talking about the nation as an idea or are we invoking the idea of a particular set of bodies in a particular territory? And there used to be an old Roman adage, those who are in the territory are of the territory. Now, a territorial focus, so the, on the, a focus on the idea of being placed, and again, that's why I use the language of being placed and being graced in what I um, said before. The idea of being placed in proximity to others, dependent on common systems and structures, where, the, where we can imagine a kind of collective form of life, that does hold some meaning to me. And I think it's interesting that Pope Francis takes up the idea of, he talks about cultures, um, and peoples in the plural. So he tends to pluralize, but you know, it does take that kind of, you know, the lines from the book of Revelation, uh, those from every culture, every people, every tribe, every nation presented before the throne of, of God. There is a sense in which that language is taken up biblically, even into the kind of final times. So it seems to have some significant theological import, but the idea of a single nation or the nation or the ethnos simply as an idea or ethnos as a singularity, I think leads us into quite problematic territory. But the idea of something placed, of a group of embodied people People from many different traditions and backgrounds um, who share a territory and a place, have a common responsibility to each other and where that can be meaningful. That is the stuff of the common good, in my view. But that will include people who don't formally have permanent state membership, who are not just fellow citizens. It includes those who share a space, a place and a time and meaningfully can be thought of as a collective entity. That, I think, is fruitful to pursue. Thank you. We're coming into our final few minutes now, and I want our conversation to land in, in a very practical space. So I've got a few questions that have come through that are um, more, more, more um, uh, or less practical. One from Stephen. How has the pandemic brought or has the pandemic brought any changes relevant to this? Reminding us of whatever our political or ideological views we need to deal with in common. Basically, would you have said anything different two years ago had we had this conversation? I think, uh, yeah, I think the pandemic has been the great revealer. I think most of the things that the pandemic has shown us are things that were true beforehand. So they were either processes that were already in play, but we chose to look away from. And the pandemic has just like made them raw and presented them to us as, as just absolute social realities. So the way in which the pandemic has revealed structures of inequality, um, you know, the virus has not affected us all in the same way. We've not all been in the same boat from everything from access to digital um, technology to our housing situation to private spaces um, to vaccine available. I mean, you know, every form of inequality has been revealed um, in a very barefaced way. But those structures were there beforehand. There's been an intensification and an increased um, visibility to those in a way that makes them, I think, just more apparent. Um, I do think, though, that the fact of the pandemic has revealed to us the myth of the isolated individual chooser, that consumer citizen that Sandel was so keen to uh, dismiss. It's just not how we live. It's not how we're wired. And when the chips are down, um, we need other narratives to help make sense of the way that we live and have to make choices. So I think the pandemic in that sense has been the great revealer. It's been a kind of exaggerator of those realities, but it has made plain that there is something common 
Um, and the question is whether we're able to um, live into that and maximize it as a genuine good for all. So I think it just intensifies the questions really and throws up a new series of dilemmas. I do you think that obviously there are ways in which we um, are probably um, potentially in a more depressing place than we might have been maybe 18 months ago. I think the early phases of the pandemic um, claps for the NHS and a sense of kind of um, convivial communal spirit around the early stages in our own context. Um, I think that's slightly given way um, to something rather different. Um, and the danger is actually we could become quite dispirited. Um, and that, I mean, that's another strand of conversation. But yeah. So, so on, on the back of that, let me ask a horribly specific question, um, which is, in the news in the last 24 hours or so, we've had a lot of talk of government policy on um, making social care workers and now NHS workers have jab or double jab or lose their jobs. In fact, obviously, the you most recently is that they're likely to row back on um, NHS workers um, because of Omicron not being as serious. Would common good thinking basically support that view? Would it say that, well, hang on, this is, a, this, is, this is a very obviously a good we're talking about here, and particularly a good when you're dealing with vulnerable people, and okay, you may want to make certain choices about bodily autonomy, but you have a wider responsibility to those whose care you are there to live, and therefore you should. You should be jammed. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I never think that there's a straight line between abstract common good thinking and a particular policy outcome. I think it requires a mediating community of um, reasoned engagement, of moral discourse and debate. And I think part of the problem is, um, again, where are those communities of encounter that allow for that moral debate in all its sharpness to be had? The things that a common good perspective would absolutely contribute to a debate over should you be vaccinated or not is um, a basic sense that um, you have responsibilities to both yourself um, and to other human beings, that you should not bring harm to somebody else, that the basic orientation of a human being is both to their own welfare and the welfare of others, and that harm should be avoided or mitigated. Um, Equally, a common good perspective, I think, would be nervous of the idea that coercive force is the first place that you go to in a, in a, um, in a social register of trying to build a common life. And that actually a mutual exercise of reasoned freedom um, is, a better, is a better place to, to be in. So there's something gone badly wrong with our process, I think, if we are in a position where very quickly we would have to simply use coercive measures in order to encourage people, get people to be vaccinated. But absolutely, there's a sense of common and mutual responsibility, but it's reasoning out what that looks like. And it's carrying people with that process, ideally through, through persuasion and relationship building. And if one of the things that stops people being vaccinated is fear, misinformation, um, a concern that there's already structures of inequality built into vaccine regimes, et cetera, then those have to be encountered and engaged with. So there's a question about who gets listened to in the common good conversation and process. So there's all sorts of complicated questions about power um, that structure that conversation about vaccine um, um, compulsion. So I think it's slightly more complicated than just a straight line between vaccine, you have it done, that's the common good tick. Um, we're almost running out of time, so I'm going to ask one more question. Um, it's just hoovering up a few of the questions that have come through in the Q&A box. Um, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, it's quite a big question and you don't have much time to answer it, so I apologise for that. But it's a question about intermediary spaces from one person asking, so, you know, you work in a university. Can universities be intermediary spaces or have they become too much instruments of meritocracy, which is obviously one of Michael Sandel's arguments and somebody else's arts more generally? Where are the glimpses? of some of these intermediary spaces. So leave us, I'm gonna give you 60 seconds, I'm sorry, Anna, on a positive note about where is it working? Where are the intermediary spaces that we might look to where we can see the process of the common good unfolding? There are loads of intermediary spaces and so there should be, and they should be radically different and disagreeing ones. So I believe in a kind of an, an anarchic space of plural intermediary spaces popping up all over the place so that you get little platoons of them. I think they're there in some forms of um, community organising and asset based community development. I think they're there in grassroots ecological um, processes. Um, I think they're there in, um, uh, in forms of uh, radical activism um, on migration uh, beyond borders. 
Um, I think that they are there. I, I mean, universities, I'm not totally sure that they at the moment are brilliant intermediary spaces, if I'm honest. And, and I think there's a radical critique to be made of universities as intermediary spaces. So I won't actually claim my own context as necessarily a great example of that. But I think they're there um, across local communities and spaces. And we simply need to be able to identify them, to nurture them, to learn from what much of what's happening in those contexts and to build the structures, as I said earlier, outwards and upwards. Go out, look, look for them. They're there in your context. The question is, do you know about them and do they know about you? Thank you very much. That's a lovely, succinct answer. I particularly like the way you managed to weave in anarchic spaces and Berkey and little platoons in the same answer, <laughs> spanning the entirety <laughs> of the political spectrum. <laughs> lovely. Anna, thank you ever so much indeed for giving us your um, time and wisdom over the last hour or so. The book, which will be on the screen shortly, is Towards the Politics of Communion. I hope you can see it there. It is, um, it is food for the mind. Um, and I strongly encourage people to go out and buy and read a copy. Um, do also check out the Theos website for our publications, for other events. If you're so minded to support us in the work we do, we are very grateful for that. Next week's seminar will be with Dr. Jonathan Chaplin on renewing democratic pluralism, same time next week. Um, do book in and join us for that. In the meantime, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Oh, sorry, thank you for Anna Wheeler, I've got a big one who has been masterfully behind the Absolutely. scenes, orchestrating and organising a smooth um, seminar. Anna, thank you very much indeed. But above all, thank you, Anna, for sharing your thoughts with us. And to Nick and everyone who's come, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>